The World We Create, From God to Market, by Thomas Bjorkman, read by Mark Meadows. In this closing chapter, I would like to highlight some of the main lessons from this book and point towards some promising directions. Ideally, I have been able to convince the listener that it is we who create the world, that we can influence the path we want the world to develop along. It is my hope that I have shared new perspectives that can assist us at this important crossroads in human history. It is up to you, the listener, how you will use these perspectives and ideas. It may not give you a list of new things to do when you wake up tomorrow, but it may have influenced how you interpret the world, the time we live in, your relationships and yourself. In a way, it is an impossible task to share new perspectives. How does the experienced meditation teacher share their hard-earned spiritual insights? How does the designer share their sense of style? And how does a thinking and sentient being, which is the sense in which I wish to speak to you in this book, share their view of life, the human being, history and reality? You and I are part of the same great weave. We share symbols, we share deeply human experiences, and we both make impressions on society. But as we make our impressions and choose our paths, might we do so with a better common map for what society's development means? Can we see in ourselves and in each other how society develops, how society can grow and become more mature? Can we jointly create a more conscious society? We humans need narratives. We humans need our narratives. This is how we make sense, how we make meaning of the world and find direction. Postmodern philosophy has helped us understand that all narratives and so-called meta-narratives are human constructs and part of our collective imaginaries. Whether the meta-narratives are about God, science or the market, they are all made up by us humans for the benefits of us humans, or at least for some of us. They convey efficiency, power and meaning, and they are at the core of our collective imaginary. It is our narratives that help us survive and flourish as a collective and as individuals. We cannot live without our narratives. They create order and direction in our otherwise chaotic reality and life. This was the case when we gathered around campfires in the Stone Age, and it remains equally so when we gather around internet discussion forums today. Our collective imaginary must be anchored in an overarching narrative to give its constituent symbols a firm contextual foundation that furnishes meaning that ties the whole thought perspective it is derived from together into a coherent and accessible pattern. Our life force requires focus, and meaning is about focusing energy in an otherwise chaotic world. A meta-narrative is also needed to establish and articulate the principles from which the thought perspective draws its highest authority on truth that every thought perspective, as mentioned, inevitably contains, however abstractly conceived and implicit that might be. We may not like the idea of an authority on truth. We may rephrase it and use the term epistemology instead. But no matter how we phrase it, we need to make the conscious effort to articulate what our worldview considers valid beliefs and opinions. If we don't, we will risk blindfolding ourselves and thereby failing to see what is guiding our thinking and behaviour. If we refuse to acknowledge what has become our highest authority, we will lose the opportunity to hold it accountable. Every thought perspective has a fundamental flaw. Postmodernism's is that its internal thought structure, so beneficial in many other regards, has blinded its followers from acknowledging that their rejection of all authorities has inadvertently made the power of the market the highest authority. This is in turn the Achilles' heel that is the point of departure for the thought perspective to replace postmodernism. The meta-narrative of what I have chosen to call metamodernism will therefore need to address this issue. Metamodernism must, in extension of this, also create a new meta-narrative that convincingly articulates a story about its own highest authority. 
this would need to answer why the preceding authorities are not based on sufficiently consistent claims of universality and how they contradict themselves. From a meta-modern perspective, God, science or the market are no longer sufficient as narratives to provide us the objectives and meaning-making we need in our complex world today. These lower levels of meaning-making are simultaneously responsible for correspondingly lower levels of efficiency and fairness, expressions of power relations and empowerment. The new meta-narrative to serve as a contextual framework for the meta-modern thought perspective will therefore need to contain superior explanatory power regarding all three of these crucial aspects consistency, meaning-making and its effect upon efficiency and fairness. But what exactly is a meta-narrative? A meta-narrative might be linked to a thought perspective in the way the term has been used throughout this book, the overarching story that every society tells about the world and the human being's role in this, and the prevailing narrative about society itself. Religion created various overarching narratives about how the human being has a special role to play in a greater, enchanted world that stretches beyond our immediate perception. Modern science created many different small and big stories about how the world follows predetermined laws and that the human being has a random and arbitrary role in an indifferent universe but can still make this world their home by getting to know its alien, law-bound secrets. Postmodernism created a major story of the dissolution of all the grand human-made narratives with a flood of minor tales in its wake where contexts, discourses, cultures and identities produce a non-cohesive multitude of experienced worlds that humans can only observe and participate in from their own limited perspective. Metamodernism should therefore have a similar overarching story to tell about the world and our role in it. Additionally, it must clarify its own role to play in the world and in people's lives. Thus, a meta-narrative is not exactly the same as a thought perspective. It is the story that a society tells about itself and its thought perspective. The meta-narrative is a large library of non-arbitrarily catalogued and interrelated narratives. Postmodernism believes that there is no such library Metamodernism builds and organises the library of a thousand narratives. It organises its own meta-narrative. Yes, there will be multiplicity, chaos and contradiction, yet higher orders are concealed within. Some narratives may be brought to the fore, tweaked and used in different context. And the structure of each narrative. As such, it spites the authorities of old. No. God, science and market, you are not in charge, we are. The metamodern mind, body and soul collects and interrelates the many narratives, looking for the inventors of new ones, for the co-creators of our age. It gathers some of the most abstracted and profound narratives and labels them as parts of the metamodern. Common to these different metamodern narratives is that, in a similar way as the previous thought perspectives, they provide a basic structure for how we might orient ourselves in the world and how new ways of creating meaning might arise. With the metamodern insights regarding evolution, self organization, complexity, individuation, integration, and the transpersonal individual, we can, I hope, sense some new patterns in people's thinking that today are gaining in strength and might eventually make their way into the meta-narratives that metamodernism tells about itself. By necessity, the new meta-narratives and their perceived common sense must be more abstract than the previous ones. There are three reasons why that is. Firstly, it is quite simply harder to fathom and incorporate a more complex thought perspective into one's thinking since it requires broader knowledge and coordination of more forms of understanding. Secondly, it must be able to handle more complex phenomena, such as climate change or a global transnational world order, with highly advanced and rapidly evolving technologies which need to be perceived and articulated in more abstract terms to be made intuitively comprehensible to our Stone Age brains. Thirdly, a new meta-narrative must be considerably more spacious than the previous ones. 
it must be able to discern opportunities for positive interaction between many people's vastly different worldviews, levels of psychological development and cultural backgrounds, not to mention different areas of knowledge. Once again, this requires a higher level of abstraction in the symbol tools used to articulate the new thought perspective's meta-narrative. If I am accused of being too abstract in this book, I would respond that it is actually our new complex reality that demands this level of abstraction. To abstract is to pull out that which is most essential, to see patterns or governing principles in a thorny reality, seeing the trees indeed, but also creating a sense of what kind of forest we are strolling through. We will, of course, for the foreseeable future, have human beings that think, act and create meaning from very different levels of narratives, different stories about life and reality. The large majority of our fellow humans will still have religion, science or the market as their points of departure. Nonetheless, the need for groups in all parts of society that understand each other on a more abstract level persists. Naturally, we cannot fully understand each other's areas of expertise, the specialised knowledge therein, or each other's unique experiences. But we might have better shared common sense as a starting point when we cooperate and communicate. Components of New Narratives I think that any meta-modern meta-narrative has to be a story of stories. An evolving story of nested and interconnected stories on global, regional and local levels. We need narratives on all levels to make sense of the world – individual, family, local, national, regional and global. All these narratives have to reflect many perspectives – not just because we live in a multicultural world, but because evolution works through differentiation and integration, and in a rapidly developing technological environment, we need a lot of differentiation for the cultural evolution to keep up but the narratives also have to be interlinked and nested within each other in increasing complexity and scope, and be in healthy competition and cooperation with each other. And we have to acknowledge that this is an ongoing process, that no narratives are final. The narratives themselves need to evolve in the ongoing development of our world. What is beautiful in this search for our new narrative about the human being and its world is that we will never complete it. It is an ongoing search without end, a never-ending protosynthesis, if you will. Any new narrative will have to be viewed only as a proto-narrative in this ongoing search process. It is yet another self-organising evolutionary process, with its own constitutive rules, which constantly challenges the narrative and keeps the dialogue alive. And the meta-narratives will revolve around precisely this search for the great tales that manage to nurture and maintain all of our different stories and perspectives that in today's world are trying to outcompete and displace each other. Maintaining different perspectives from all of our human narratives might help us glimpse as many aspects of our world as possible. But not to get lost in the postmodern hall of mirrors of perspectives, an artery in our new metamodern narratives is the direction. Religion had the union with the divine. Science had progress. The market and postmodernism struggled to create a positive direction in the story, but at least there was an effort to see the individual's self fulfillment as a fundamental driving force. Any new meta narrative must be one that is directed towards the global, sustainable society and towards the human being's ability to attain self-realisation in two ways. We have already mentioned both of them, that we as individuals become responsible adults and, as a society, attain a higher level of freedom and responsibility than we have known so far. With our new insights, we can now affirm that it is not, as the Middle Age philosophers thought, a case of using human logos to understand God's telos in nature. Instead, it is about using Logos and Eros to create human telos in our collective imaginary and in this way build in greater consciousness in our society. Here, developmental psychology, 
Bildung, Philosophy, or an increased spiritual sensibility may chart a way forward. It seems to be the case that the human being will develop towards a higher level of consciousness given favorable circumstances. Such consciousness entails a higher level of cognitive complexity and self-awareness, increased capacity for empathy and extended circles of belonging. This, in turn, entails a lower degree of defensive, deficiency-based self-interest and a more abstract identification with the world, society and nature. In this way, our solidarity is deepened and extended to comprise a greater number of sentient beings in more ways. The abolition of slavery, the introduction of democracy and human rights, the emergence of the welfare society and increased gender equality can all be seen as steps in this direction towards a more conscious society. Again, I am by no means arguing that a positive development towards a more self-aware global human is predetermined or automatic. Throughout world history, we have repeatedly seen how decisive both individual and collective human decisions have been in shaping the future. But with a higher level of psychological and cultural development, we boost our chances and our freedom to make crucial decisions, both individually and collectively. There is good reason to believe that if we do not reach higher levels of development, this century will see even more burdensome crises and unfortunately also catastrophes. The human being's most complex and decisive issue in the new meta-narrative is therefore our personal psychological development and a corresponding development of our shared culture and societal structures. This is the most important project in human history today. It started many thousands of years ago, but it has only just begun. When the complexity in our society increases, the process might get caught in a blind alley, just as it has done now, and must be rebooted again. My Proto-Narrative I do not want to propose new meta-narratives that blindly praise the human being at the expense of the rest of the biosphere and the universe, that the human being develops also means that the understandings we have had of ourselves is surpassed. As early as in Nietzsche's writings, we might sense such a perspective. When the human being really grows up, when we truly realise that God, all our gods, new and old, is dead, then we become something other than the human being that we hitherto have known. A new meta-narrative might therefore harbour an undertone of post-humanism a theme that has become frequent among many contemporary philosophers. The term post-humanism can trigger negative associations, but its purpose is not to dehumanize us or hollow out our human dignity. Rather, post-humanism means that the human being no longer sees itself as the measure and meaning of everything, but that we are parts of a greater reality and evolutionary process. As stated before, we live in a complex and rapidly developing time and therefore need many interlinked proto-narratives. Any meta-modern narrative that I might embrace will have to be a proto-narrative that needs to be open to reinterpretation and reformulation as I mature and the world around me changes. If I, in a socialised mind, too deeply define myself from a specific static narrative, I will hurt myself and possibly those around me. I should strive to hold my narrative lightly and see the possibility of change. If I do need a prefabricated narrative to internalise from my culture, it has to be a narrative around change and growth, that we as individuals and society are on a developmental journey and that change and growth is the new normal. We should, on all levels, go from a belief in a fixed, externally given meta-narrative to an internally generated and lightly held proto-narrative. My contribution to these framing stories can be told on three levels, personal, collective and universal, that are of different complexity, depth and reach, and therefore will resonate differently with us depending on where we are on the life journey of maturation and consciousness development. They all take their starting point in the rapid technological development we are experiencing right now.
We are living at a very critical time. The exponential technological growth that we discussed in Chapter 11 gives rise to opportunities and challenges on a scale that humanity has never faced before. Never before in history has humanity gone through such fundamental change in framing conditions. Even though throughout history humanity has seen many major shifts in technology, like the invention of farming or industrialization of production, we used to be able to adapt to new technologies between generations. Older generations could, if they wished, remain with previous technologies and the new generations would adapt. You could remain a farmer for the rest of your life, but your children might decide to move to the city and become factory workers. This was the experience of most human beings in the past. Technological change, if it happened at all, occurred from one generation to the next. The pace of change allowed for the older generation to literally die out without embracing the change. Then, what was once novel could be embraced fully by their children and became a new norm. We now live in a world where disruptive change happens many times within our lifetime. A typical 50-year-old person living in the developed world today will have experienced several major technological shifts during their lifetime, changes that meant new structures in social life, work life, in access to information, and in meaning-making. They have, for example, lived through the transitions from landlines, mainframe computers and letters, to the World Wide Web, smartphones, the Internet of Things, and the rise of artificial intelligence. Unlike in the past, such shifts have not been something that could be ignored and left for the next generation to embrace. Our brains are not wired for this, and the world we have created has become very complex and very rapidly changing. Consequently, we suffer stress from confusion and loss of ability to make meaning. New technology and new ways of life now impact every part of the Earth, and the scale of human impact on our planet is so great that geologists have concluded that we have created a new geological epoch which they have named the Anthropocene. While anthropogenic or human-made climate change is the poster child, there are many other consequences of both our sheer numbers and the way we interact with the biosphere that are equally significant and damaging. We are transcending the boundaries of a safe operating space for humanity with respect to most of the key indicators identified by science. These range from land use, fresh water cycles and biogeochemical flows of nitrogen and phosphorus to atmospheric aerosol loading, chemical pollution and ocean acidification. The latest scientific insights suggest that our failure to respond at sufficient scale and with sufficient urgency means that we are already at a stage where, at best, we may be able to stabilise the natural systems on which we and our civilizations depend for our existence. Restoring them, we are told, may already be beyond our reach. History has shown us many examples of civilizations collapsing from over-exploitation of nature the Mayan civilization of the Americas and the Roman Empire in Europe and North Africa, to name but two. The difference is, this time, the consequences are global. As stated before, we can try to understand these challenges and frame a narrative around them on three levels, personal, collective and universal. Personal level the story on this level can be told from a strictly personal, individualistic and instrumental perspective. This is a story that can easily resonate with a majority of the population in the West, and it goes something like this. In this rapidly moving world, it is impossible to know what specific skills we ourselves and our children need to develop in order to just be able to keep up with change. If you spend three years learning to program and code, Chances are that in five to ten years, coding and programming are done exclusively by artificial intelligence. Therefore, we need to focus more on the fundamental life skills that we in Chapter 12 called transformative skills. By focusing on developing our capacity for compassion, perspective-taking, complex sense-making and self-knowledge, etc., 
we will be better prepared as individuals to meet a future we can know very little about, apart from the fact that it will be even more complex and rapidly developing. As the world around us becomes more and more complex, we have to evolve our thinking and being in the world. We have to evolve our minds, and we understand that this will be a lifelong challenge. By focusing on developing transformative skills, we will be advancing in the different dimensions of consciousness development we explored in Chapter 12. This will result in a general increase in consciousness in society. Collective Level On the collective level, we expand our horizons in time and space and go from our individual lives and lifelong development to that of civilizations. We go from a perspective of 10 to 50 years to a perspective of 100 years and beyond. Here, the narrative is that our modern worldview has given us extraordinary development, but is no longer able to help us in the next step. The complexity of our challenges demands a response at the level of changing our paradigm, our collective imaginary. The task is urgent, as we are at a bifurcation point where collapse is also a real possibility. Humanity has reached the end of the currently dominating civilization and worldview, and we need to collectively move on and give room for the birth of a new civilization. As we rapidly approach this bifurcation point, our individual minds, as developing complex self organizing systems, interact with the developing complex self organizing systems of our societal culture and institutions. The unavoidable phase shift could go in two directions. The emergence of a more interconnected, more complex and more conscious society, or the disconnect, breakdown and fragmentation of our human world. The ability of any developing complex self-organizing systems to find new stability in higher states of complexity depends on the ability of the individual parts of the system to begin to relate in deeper and more complex ways. Developing the transformative skills mentioned earlier would therefore not just be important for individual consciousness development and the individual's ability to adapt, but also, importantly, be crucial for the support of the collective transformation of society. The way we view the world is, as we have seen throughout the book, important for the way we make meaning and therefore act in the world. Early in life we download our worldview from our surrounding culture. A shift in worldview is therefore much more dependent on a collective cultural shift rather than just individual developmental efforts. Starting to collectively deepen and widen our worldview will therefore also be an important contribution to a successful societal transformation. We have throughout the book been exploring blind spots in our currently dominating Western worldview, areas where our limited understanding today will have to be deepened in order to see the world in different and deeper perspectives necessary to successfully meet our current challenges. One way to get an overview of these blind spots discussed throughout the book could be to gather them under five headings. Our view of ourselves, from separation to connection and relationship. Our view of the world, from a world of things to a world of evolving processes. Our view of our mind, from rational and fixed to a constantly evolving living system. Our view of society, from something given to something socially constructed out of our thinking and acting today. Our view of our lives, from a focus on material success as an end in itself to a focus on purpose and meaning. The shifts of perspective above that we have been exploring throughout the book are becoming more and more accepted and applied in academia and in social activism. But many academics, organisations and projects today only use one or two such new perspectives. As the complexity of the context is so high, all five shifts of perspective must be applied in our understanding to every aspect of our human world, including the interconnection of these aspects, in order to activate the potential for deep change. Organisations or projects that disregard one or two of these insights and shifts 
are more likely to face significant systemic pushback from blind spots in their approach. If we do not achieve a transition to a new worldview, it seems probable that the forces we have set in motion, especially within the natural world and the biosphere, will tip us into a collapse. Universal level We could stop our story at the collective level. All the important insights for increasing the probability for a successful next step in human history are there, and we can find meaning in life through consciously participating in the creation of a better world. But as we mature, we might slowly start to realize that we are an integral part of the universal evolution and story we started to explore in Chapter 1, and our story can again be expanded to even wider perspectives. Throughout human history, from the Renaissance to the Scientific Revolution to the Enlightenment to full-blown modernity and its postmodern critics, we can see a similar pattern emerging. Our place in the universe has been pushed farther and farther into the periphery of reality itself. We are no longer God's chosen children, not at the centre of the world, and even our emotions, thoughts and choices are, according to latest research, beyond us. At the same time, in what seems to be a strange and wonderful paradox, each time we are dethroned by the history of science, we rise above our previous understanding and become more intimately involved as self-conscious co-creators in the universe. At the same time as we realize our insignificance in the universe, our sense of agency and responsibility for our world and its place in the universe increases. We have now the uniquely human possibility to self-consciously see the interaction between our personal evolving meaning-making and the evolution of our collective imaginary an interaction that takes place within and is a unique expression of the universal evolution of cosmos. By this self-consciousness, we now also have the opportunity to align our personal purpose and meaning-making with the 13.8 billion years old evolutionary impulse of the universe. This alignment of the personal, collective and universal evolutionary processes is the maturity that we need to participate in the world in a more responsible and meaningful way. And in some remarkable way, something greater than ourselves, perhaps not God, but at least a deeper universal meaning, has slipped in through the back door. I began this book by using the Big Bang and evolution at the universal scale as a springboard. Although it might have seemed grandiose to connect our own history to the birth of the universe, we can now see that the universal story offers a perspective from which to see ourselves and our future as part of a greater and deeper unfolding and development. It has been somewhat poetically observed that we are nothing but stardust, that we are made up of the same kinds of particles that we share with all celestial objects. This metaphor serves to illustrate that we are the result of the same fundamental evolutionary process that began with the Big Bang. The story I have told in this book takes its starting point in my own background within a Western, natural science, materialistic worldview, and investigates the strengths and limitations of this approach. This is the language I, and many other in the West and elsewhere, are most familiar and comfortable with. I could instead have started from the point of panpsychism, the view that consciousness or mind is a universal and primordial feature of all things, but that would have been a less intuitive story for most Western listeners. The origin of the universe and the primordial forces and principles that still govern it are beyond human metaphors and understanding, so whatever language we choose to describe them, it will always be an anthropocentric projection. The end point of this book would still have been the same. The main reason to connect to our cosmic origins is therefore not to explain the physical mechanisms that gave rise to biological thinking creatures like ourselves. In a time where the divine creation myths of yesterday have lost their explanatory power, and with that the beauty of our origins to be derived from there, seeing our everyday lives and accomplishments as parts of the history of the universe could make us feel like the descendants of the great mother Big Bang, a perspective from which we could find renewed meaning 
and a sense of connection to all of creation. A modern creation myth, as proposed by the historian David Christian, with its point of departure going back to the very beginning of what we have an understanding of, could be the foundation of a new shared meta-narrative needed to foster a stronger feeling of belongingness and interconnectedness to all of humankind and the natural environment we all share. If we see ourselves and others, despite our differences, as intimately connected and ultimately part of the same all-encompassing reality, the result could be that we started to experience a higher and more inclusive level of solidarity and compassion. The scientifically explored universe, with its unfathomable astrophysical dimensions, leaves us very few messages about the meaning of life. No divine commandments are written in the starry skies, and no gospel rings through the quiet, cold expanse of the cosmos. Instead, it invites us to something else, to see the mystery of existence and our own situation in a wider world. Sometimes I hear friends late at night, as they gaze at the sky, perhaps after a drink too many, talk about how small they feel in the great universe. But I do not feel this way. I feel that we are part of a seemingly boundless, self-organising universe, where life, consciousness and intelligence can flourish and observe this remarkable world and give it meaning. We are meaning-making creatures in a universe that otherwise would be void of meaning. In this unique position, it is actually the heavens that need us in order to be looked upon, and in some peculiar way recognised for the beauty and mystery they contain. What comes after God, science and the market? Naturally, I cannot know what will happen or what kinds of development await, but I can say what I wish for and what I think we can achieve together. We have already come so far that if we distributed humanity's resources fairly so that everyone has their basic material needs met, we could go further and attain a society that supports every human's personal growth and further psychological development. A society in which so many compassionate, curious and free-thinking humans are born, who, from a deep-rooted conviction in their hearts and minds, will co-create a civilization to manifest the highest known expression of the universe's self-organizing adventure. Seeing the Big Bang as intimately connected with every daily occurrence is not to lapse into reverie and close one's eyes to the suffering in the world and the difficult challenges that confront us. On the contrary, it could be a narrative that helps us fully recognize and create meaning from the fundamental condition of tragedy pertaining to all existence while endowing us with the ability to see the beauty that permeates all aspects of creation, from the small and mundane to the vast and spectacular. Our capacity for collective meaning creation and collective imaginaries is not just something that makes us uniquely human, it is also our strongest asset to increase our chances for survival. In an increasingly complex world, our ability to create meaning is decisive for whether we face a dignified future or a tragic collapse. When we reach a point where we can intuitively sense that everything is connected in one great self-organising process, with billions of component processes that have been given emergently different properties through evolution and have become aware of the collective imaginaries fabricated by previous generations so that we can disembed ourselves from them, then it is time to take one more step in the development of our consciousness by throwing away all our symbol tools and other chimeras of our analytic mind so we do not risk mistaking them for reality. At least just for a brief moment. Don't worry, they will still be where you left them. Throw away the thought perspectives. Throw away the meta-narratives. Throw away Keegan's layers and Popper's worlds. Throw away the efficiency, power and meaning aspects of our society. Throw them all away, for they don't really exist. They are merely symbols and metaphors. The only thing that exists is an indivisible and extremely complex whole of infinite parts in constant co-evolution. 
and while we are in the process of discarding such non-existent imaginaries, maybe we should also throw away our individual self. Now we understand that this is also just a construct that we have been given by evolution to possibly navigate this indivisible whole. There quite simply are no individual selves. Something happens inside you when you really understand that you, your life and your actions are an integrated part of a constantly ongoing evolutionary process that eternally leaves traces in the future. Your way of viewing the world and yourself becomes irrevocably altered. You experience what the ancient Greeks called metanoia, a permanent inner transformation. There is no way back. You will then realize that you have a role to play in the evolution of the universe, something that you can now choose to do self-consciously. To self-consciously contribute to society's development thus becomes a source of meaning in your life. You will start seeing yourself as an agent and a link in the great co-created evolutionary process of the universe. Your self-consciousness will be shifted from yourself as an individual to all of humanity and to the evolutionary process that has been ongoing for billions of years and which, at this moment, when you and I are alive and active, is at one of its most critical stages ever. During this century, the direction for the future of humanity will be decided by the collective existential choices that confront us. And the important insight, which both obligates and liberates us, is that the future lies in our hands. <laughs>